My name is Taylor. I'm an intern at the Center for Research and Learning, and I'm so excited to introduce our first presenters, Judy and Andrew Provost. They are multi-generational farmers from Nigeria, Louisiana. They've been featured in Food and Wine, The Guardian, New York Times, and the 1619 Project. They are deeply passionate about sharing their personal experiences as Black farmers in New Iberia through honoring the legacy of their ancestors. Like so many before, they struggled to succeed in a system that was built to make them fail, yet their strength and determination is a testament to the numerous Black sugarcane farmers who came before them. Fueled by their passion, they created the Provost Farm Heritage Center and Community Garden, Provost Farms, and the Provost Farm Initiative all of which extend their work beyond farming the land and emphasize their commitment to sharing and preserving the culture of South Louisiana. Their work has created a space where people can learn about the rich history of Black farming in South Louisiana through exhibits, workshops, and educational programs. They encourage and support local farmers and constantly work for fairness and equality in the community. June and Angie. Ah, thank you. How's everyone? First question is are you is anybody connected to a sugarcane farm or a sugarcane farming family? Raise your hand. Great. So that it just is a testament to how sugarcane is a major economic and social drive for our community, right? And so the purpose of our presentation is to make you aware not only of the joys of farming, but also the struggles that we've gone through and how you all can help and assist to bring even more awareness, share the knowledge, share the story, so we can actually build equity, inclusivity, and diversity within the industry. So we can go into the next slide. So um, Provost Farm Cultivating History. Um, the Provost Farm Initiative is a cross-sector, multi-level program created by the Provost Farm Heritage Center and Community Garden, which is our nonprofit, and the Provost Farm LLC, which is our for-profit entity. Its purpose is to highlight and honor the legacy of Black sugarcane farmers in South Louisiana, while also raising public awareness about the challenges faced by Black farmers, which I just briefly stated. One of the things that June and I, on our, our journey, what we discovered is that from Senegal to Ghana, from Olivier House to Oaklawn Manor, from Lafayette Parish to St. Mary Parish, if you see, I'm pulling in all of our lineage, our DNA, where our ancestors worked, where they were forced to work and build the sugarcane industry, and knowing that our heritage, even though Louisiana is known as this French colonial French state, we are so heavily influenced by West Africa. From everything that we do, even white folks, when y'all are cooking what you call Cajun food, that jambalaya is jollof, right? Okay. So our ancestors, because of this, have encoded agriculture into our DNA. So if you're a Black farmer in here, come from a Black farming family, your ancestors have been farming for generations, for millennia since the dawn of man. So if you hear somebody come on there and say, yo, somebody saying, I'm a fifth generation farmer, well, your people have been farming since the dawn of time. Um, again, you can hear our stories in Food and Wine, The Guardian, New York Times, and more. Uh, one of the reasons that is, is because in New Iberia, and we talk about this often, is that we had to reach outward to get help. We were beating down doors here and we're constantly getting them slammed in our face. And so what we did is reached outward out of the state on a national level to get our story told. You won't hear it on KTC, unfortunately. You won't hear it on Channel 10 News, but you will hear it in these places. Next slide. So I'm not gonna do all of the talking. We are gonna go back and forth. So this is our story, June and Angie cultivating love with this pretty man right here. Um, <laughs> so one of the things about June is that 
in our relationship of falling in love, again, we are more than just farmers. We call ourselves multi-generational farm owners. Again, our ancestors have been farming forever. I will let June go ahead and describe some of your own family history. And now we're gonna get a little personal. My family, we used to farm close to 5,000 acres. Now that 5,000 acres is a hundred acre farm. I don't have time to get into all of the specifics, but you know, I always tell people farming, especially in South Louisiana, is the greatest feeling in the world. When you till in that soil, you get that smell. And I was fortunate enough to farm with my family, having a tractor and seeing my dad and my brothers on tractors, that was the greatest feeling in the world. But although that does feel good, that's not the reality of black farmers. The reality of black farmers, I'll break it down to where in 1920, there was 920,000 African-American farmers. Today, that number is less than 35,000. We used to own close to 19 million acres. Today, that number is less than 3 million. So when I say it's not a reality, Forming is a hard job. You have to worry about, like this year, you have to worry about the drought. Those are conditions you have to worry about. But as Black farmers, we always have to worry about, will we be able to get a crop loan? When will that crop loan be available for us? In Sugar King, you need that crop loan in February. As Black farmers, we're getting crop loans in July and August when the season is over. Again, 5,000 acres down to 100 acres. And like Angie said, we had doors shut in our faces all the time. <laughs> just, just to give you an example, there was a documentary done and a local senator in the boarding parish, they, he was asked, why are so many Black farmers going out of business? His answer was, it's a hard job. Maybe they can't handle it. And that's coming from a senator in, in St. Mary Parish. You can look up the documentary. That's just saying, like, Blacks couldn't quarterback an NFL team. It matters. It, it really do matter. Yes. And so, um, and June is quite humble in saying, I mean, the provost men, like my aunt's family here, she is part of the CU family out of Grand Mary. They lived and breathed sugar cane. When I tell you they lived and breathed it, <laughs> Lord Jesus, it, they do, <laughs> okay? So up here is June's father and his mother. Um, this is their wedding picture. These are actually pictures of us in Ghana. Um, and this is my grandmother and grandfather. They're both 94 and 95 and are still farming today. So, uh, like, this is what I say, embracing our commonality. This is like what makes us best friends is that, you know, I was born in Lafayette, grew up in Houston. When we met, got engaged, it was before we got engaged, but I moved back to Louisiana. Um, but it was like I never left because those Afro Creole roots were always in me. Um, and I started my own farm in 2014 because his farm was so much under attack. And when I say it was under attack, I mean, equipment was getting vandalized. Dead animals were placed in his tractors. Um, local white farmers were riding around, parking on our headland and watching us in a very intimidating way, which we have receipts. I keep receipts, video, all of that pictures of trying to intimidate us and get us out of the business. Um, but that doesn't work. Why? Because we understand our history and our value. And so understanding that we felt like we had a duty to honor our ancestors, continue their legacy, because we understand the hardship that they faced. I was having a conversation with my two aunts this week talking about when they were go having to go to segregated schools and when the schools were integrated, how difficult it was for them at that time too. So, and, and i just like, before we go on to the next slide, I'd just like to put in perspective, in Vermilion and Iberia parishes, in the late, late 90s, there were over 60 Black-formed families, not individual families. Today, that number is four. 
So you put into perspective probably 40 to 50,000 acres that was once formed by black farming families, which is still being formed, just not by us. It's being formed by white families. Right. You know how much generational wealth that's lost? I mean, you know, we should be passing on to the next generation and so many other black farming families that should have been, that should be happening and it's not. I can give you a visual history. So I would like you guys to take a ride down Highway 90 towards Generette. Leave here and go towards Generette. There was once an access road into the community of Grand Mary. There was once an elementary school. There was once a community store. But as times have gone by and resources have been taken away, the access into that community, which was a large sugarcane farming community, imagine the wealth. And I'm not talking about buying a big McMansion or a fancy truck. I'm talking about wealth, meaning infrastructure, right? So that access into that community has been closed. The school has been shut down. And they try to put in a park there, but so it, climate change, honey. Climate change, go to a park when it's hot, right? Um, I'd rather have the kids being able to walk safely to school into classes and libraries, right? I'd rather have my, if I were living in that community, I'd rather have easy access to my home, right? I'd rather have a community store still being built. So this is what the loss of the, I would say almost the black family structure is happening. It's not because we lack moral uh, standards or that we're imperfect or any of those things. It's because resources have been taken away and it's about time we start reclaiming them. Okay, next slide. All right, so going back into that, so this is more than just about sugarcane farming. This is about culture. Like I said, Louisiana is heavily influenced by West African culture. Um, and sugarcane farming is more than just about sugarcane the crop. It's about building community, which you see here, and it's also about innovation. Within agriculture, it has largely been Black men who have invented machinery and pathways to revolutionize the farming industry. Right here, you've got Norbert Ryu, right? Norbert Ryu literally just like created a system for the sugar mills to end the Jamaican train system. You know those pretty water fountain sugar kettles people like to use in their yard for decorations? Those were killing machines. They were killing machines. They were like literally damaging human bodies to create wealth for other people. So Norbert Ryu effectively ended that system. But when he ended that system, of course it comes with retaliation. He died in poverty. He's actually Edgar Degas' cousin, the famous painter. So, um, he ended up dying in poverty. Same thing with Julian Leonard Sr. June has a very close relationship with Julian Leonard III. Julian Leonard invented the automatic planter. And so instead of having to cut crops and you plant them hand by hand, you get in the tractor and there's an attachment behind you that's dropping the seed. And literally changed the game of how you plant sugar. The game, right? And I just, I can't say it enough that Black Creole folks in South Louisiana, we eat good and we eat good because of our ancestors. Again, jambalaya, beignets, which are African donuts and our Mardi Gras celebrations, right? So, I mean, there's so much we have to be proud of and joyful for. And it's not something that is just for us. One thing about us is that we are sharing and kind people, right? Everyone can enjoy this. Okay, next slide. So overcoming our barriers and cultivating justice. This is a picture from when the Pickford litigation went on. Does anybody know Pickford v. Glickman? If you do, raise your hand. 
Of course, yes, of course. Okay, so Pickford v. Glickman was the largest civil rights uh, settlement in U.S. history. Largest civil rights settlement in U.S. history. Civil rights, civil rights, right? But the settlement only awarded $50,000 to some farmers. Others didn't get it, right? And the $50,000 $50, was across the board. Didn't matter what you farmed, how much you farmed, where you were located, or any of that. So that speaks to the level of seeing us as a monolith, right? It, throughout history, we've been seen as a monolith, which we are not. Um, and so one of those things, you know, and that, that's sort of where we are. I think that is the tip of the, the, the barrier system is like people seeing our true humanity. And there are certain laws that we don't talk about at the dinner table. You know, we'll talk about things or we'll hear about things on the news, like recently uh, affirmative action, female reproductive rights, all of those things. But when you're at the ground level and you're really going through hardships, what most folks don't know, the big barrier is statute of limitation. Statute of limitations will only allow you to file a complaint or a grievance within maybe a year's time. Now we have been enslaved longer than we've been free. And we have been on this journey forever and our statute of limitations to report racism or discrimination is a year? Come on now. All right, ECOA and RICO. Basically, ECOA is your Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Farmers are dealing with commercial laws, not consumer lending. That's a big difference. So we're not buying a house, we're buying a business, okay? And RICO. RICO is something that I think should be applied more to discrimination laws because it is essentially organized crime to get a group of people out and enrich others. Um, and another thing is USDA 7 CFR codes. Those are the things that, you know, provide access to resources, feasibility. But a lot of times we are faced with nepotism, especially in these local offices. Another thing is defamation and slander. You can listen to the 1619 podcast where a local county committeeman is saying that maybe June missed the boat. Just because he was raised on a farm, he missed the boat. No, his people caught the boat. They were forced on a boat, okay? Um, and so, and also like people just being willfully ignorant about black Americans is amazing to me. Like it, it's just, um, it's disappointing. Or the fact that we are irresponsible right? So those are the things, those are some of the barriers that we face that you could read more on. You follow our journey. We're very much into teaching about all of this and sharing some of the experiences. And, and I just want to go back to Tim Pickford. We have probably bi-weekly phone calls right. that usually last an hour every time. And he's 78 years old. Till this day, he still wants to form. He's, he was in a position where we are now, but it's because of him we are able to fight. I mean, he's, he's like a mentor to me. I mean, he really is. And our probably 50 minutes of that hour conversation is talking about farming, how he loves to form and how he wishes grandkids can form. And I also have to say that correcting these laws corrects the laws for society as a whole. You know, you think of the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement led a pathway, not just for black Americans, but a lot of folks don't realize that it built a better pathway for all citizens. So that's why we are telling you statute of limitations all the way down to USDA civil rights code, so seven CFR codes, defamation and slander. All of those things are true barriers that we face. Next slide. And a big part of our journey is re healing and reclaiming who we are. And a lot of it is self-care, right? 
So we want to prioritize um, and increase support for Black farmers, especially in Louisiana. Um, we want to promote access to land ownership. We need increased land ownership and increased cooperation. Um, and foster partnerships in all of that. That's why we're so thankful for Phoebe and for John and for my beautiful Jordan and Taylor. Um, a part of that is healing. Everyone in this room, you are all part of our joy right now. And so uh, that is exactly what we are about. And again, I can't say how important local community support is. We was without that for so many years. Right. And I just want to see how important sugarcane, it's not like you can just say, okay, go find another job. Sugarcane was our life. It was our way of living. That's my family's legacy. And to finally get local support, because at one time I contemplated suicide. That's how hard it was for me, you know, losing 5,000 acres. When you lose that land, you don't get it back. They don't make any more new land. That, that's why it's so important to try to get the next generation and, and try to keep the farmers who are farming, the less than 1%, still try to keep them on the land. Exactly. So just having that local community support means a lot. Exactly. Um, so another thing, speaking on community support, uh, June and I are very aware that the Sugarcane Festival happens every year, right? And we know that we are often excluded from it. Um, but uh, we are developing ways that can celebrate our culture and bring back some honor to our communities. So if you're participating in next week's events, um, we just ask you to ask any of the board members you may come across or any other farmers, where are the black farmers? Where are the black sugarcane farmers, right? Where are the people who even used to farm sugar cane? Where is their representation? Because it's important. We don't want to continue a system of abuse, neglect, and denial. And because we had to keep this presentation short, and y'all know I could go on and on. Uh, so next slide, I'm just just a quick video. So we won the Public Justice Award in uh, 2022. Got to fly to Seattle did a whole speech there. And at one time we couldn't find any attorneys, but like I said, we reached out. We were like hanging out with a room of thousands of attorneys that night. So it was really great. And we got the award the same night with Hillary Clinton. No matter what your politics are, it was great for us. Planting sugar cane and, and once you see it pop out the ground, that's for me, it's, it's like a sense of hope because you have a new crop that's growing. And it's not a better feeling in the world when you see what you planted and, and it pops out of the ground. In this area, at one time, there were 60 black farms. Now that number is four. That's hard when you see that. I mean, for instance, like we used to farm this whole big old block here. This whole block we used to farm. I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult to see because it's, you know, it's, it's not us on the property. And it's no reason why we shouldn't be on the property. No reason. Farming for black people is the oldest occupation for us in, in the United States. We went from slaves uh, to, to, to sharecroppers, uh, surviving, horrific laws at Jim Crow, all of these things that we had to endure. Angie and June are just such wonderful salt of the earth people. They ran this sugarcane farm in Iberia Parish, and they were some of the few remaining black farmers in, in the country, and particularly in Louisiana. When June was working as a farmer, he won awards for the, for the crop that he made. You would think 5,000 acres, I would have been okay, but actually, I wasn't. Within 10 or 15 years of award-winning crops, he was bankrupt, lost the farm, lost everything. Um, and the, the other parties in this litigation 
said that he was just a bad farmer. I mean, I contemplated suicide because I, I felt like I lost everything. The loans that were involved in, in the Provost family and what ultimately led to the destruction of their business were FSA guaranteed crop loans. For sugarcane, you, you need at least six to $800 per acre. So if you do that times 5,000 acres, I mean, you, you're, you're looking at almost a $4 million crop loan that you need to farm that adequately. The USDA was approving like just about a million or a little less for him. Ultimately, the deck was stacked so much against him that there was almost no way that they could succeed, and they didn't. His USDA guaranteed lender was photocopying his signature to farm loans and lowering the approved amount. That's what was happening. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we had dead cats placed in a tractor. We right. had the windows blown out with a gun. We had center blocks, brand new center blocks placed in the middle of the field right. when I started cutting the cane and it just broke up all the blades. I mean, they wanted us out of form and by any means necessary. But, you know, we, we made the decision to fight back though. So, and, and that's what we we're gonna do. And that's what we're doing. Right. Provost versus First Guarantee Bank was filed in federal district court in New Orleans. The original theory of the case was that the Provost family had been discriminated against in the lending practices of the bank. We did settle the case. Um, but there's still so much work to there, be done. There's still so much. I mean, litigation is hard. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, is that litigation is not easy. When we finally got to the end of the case, we try to get Angie and June eligible for the American Rescue Plan provision that was going to forgive the loans to black farmers. And ultimately, that, that was going to be the success of the claim that they made. The American Rescue Plan provision for the loan forgiveness has been stayed by various federal courts. And so they have nothing. Now, since they did these court cases with, you know, with Miller, not everything is on hold. You know, some of these judges should be ashamed of themselves because they know the history. It was white farmers who got 99.9% .9 of the debt relief in the first place. And that's why we wound up in federal court, and that's why we turned to Congress to, to actually try to get the relief. And, you know, I think it's very significant that they've admitted to past discrimination, but they're not willing to admit to the ongoing filing of complaints, the ongoing discrimination. The reason why we tell our story is not because we want to see a system torn down, is that we want to see the system better for us all. That's it. So I have one more slide and we'll close up. So uh, after we settled our litigation, American Rescue Plan Act uh, went into effect. Of course, there was a retaliatory lawsuit that stopped the American Rescue Plan Act relief. Um, so uh, what happened was is that a group of us farmers got together, pressured Congress. Uh, we went up to D.C. And we got some provisions passed within the Inflation Reduction Act, with, which got a lot of our debt paid. Okay, hallelujah, right? Okay, so if you go to the next slide, we are still fighting though. We are still uncovering more dirty dirt deeds, right? So we're still uncovering things. You know how I mentioned the photocopied signatures? So we're still uncovering other like, egregious activity that's happening within the agency. Um, but that doesn't stop us again from finding our joy and healing. So what we've done is, is that we started taking our farm shop, old picture of it. Look at this, right? 
This is it now. Okay. So what we are doing, it came out of the fact that talking to my aunts, my mom and dad, grandparents, back in the day during segregation, even up until the 70s or 80s, Black folks didn't have many places to go to have fun, right? So we congregated in church halls, the Knights of Peter Claver, right? We congregated, um, you know, at people's homes um, and farm shops, right? And so that's where the idea of revamping our farm shop came from is like, man, if we redo this, man, we could throw some good crawfish balls up in here. <laughs> and so, but uh, having developing a relationship with Jordan, with Miss Phoebe, Mr. John, Taylor, everybody, um, Panat has been a, a good influence for us too, is that we need to do more for the community so it is becoming a place where we'll be hosting meetings and exhibits and programming. Um, and I just wanna add that this is a picture of June on the courthouse steps here in New Iberia when we got the deed to our house back. And so that house is a family home where my beautiful aunts are staying right now. And so the next, oh, do you wanna add? Yeah, Sorry. I, just, I just wanna add one thing. Um, our house was foreclosed on on Sugar King Festival, Festival weekend, weekend in 2018. The weekend farmers are supposed to be celebrating. So just kind of, we think it's full circle. We're trying to have an open house, but actually next weekend, the Saturday, we are having black farmers from throughout the parishes, Sugar probably King, 30 black to 40 Sugar black farmers, farmers that are going to be at yes. our shop with Southern University. So that's full that's circle full moment, circle us, so. full circle moment. Um, and next slide. This is just to close out to say how you guys, we wanna thank you all. Uh, Carl's gonna come up next and rock it out. And so um, this is how you can participate. Sign up for our newsletters, tell people to donate, uh, because what we're trying to do is continue the build out of the shop and infrastructure and all of that. So thank y'all so much. Thank y'all. Before I do this program, it's supported oh. by funds from the National Endowment for Social Media and the National Trust for Social Media. Mr. Carl Peter Jr. is an entrepreneur and advocate of partner and partner. Carl has been a member of the Department of Public Grade as an industrial painter, doctor, and has been a top grade community during that time, he also attended all his master classes, which inspired him to indulge more in the community and the outdoors. Carl grew a passion for entrepreneurship, history, African studies, and grew in student art for many years. Carl has a local business in the community called the Dairy Market, which offers a positive, safe space and atmosphere, fresh local fruits and vegetables, herbs, and goods, jams, jellies, sauces, and cookies. There are also Afrocentric books, soaps, handmade jewelry, art, garden training, chess club, and other products and activities. Over time, Carl grew a strong passion for generating ancestors through his passions and daily walking. He enjoys giving back while empowering himself and those around him. He strives to be a beacon of light, strength, determination, and perseverance. Carl realized in his life that knowledge itself was the key to bring his mental change and a clear way to a new and more significant school of thought. By being steadfast to this new way of life and thinking, doors of opportunity opened tremendously for Carl and have not closed. In the words of the great and honorable Marcus Messiah Davy, up you mighty race and accomplish what you will. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing today? Thank you all for coming out. It's good seeing you all, feeling the energy and the support and, you know, just being in tune with New Iberia and being in tune with where we are in the world today. Um, that was a beautiful representation you all had. You know, I learned many things there, um, felt empowered with, you know, the way y'all delivered the message, you know, the background that you all have, um, that family bond, you know, all of that, that I also inspired, you know, incorporate in my life in many ways. But uh, thank you for sharing y'all's story. Um, so I'm a transplant uh, here in New Iberia. I'm coming from Georgia. I grew up in Georgia, but I'm actually from Mississippi. So that's where my roots are. Um, my family also did um, farming work, but uh, it was more so coming from, you know, Mississippi. Am I loud enough? What about now? What about now? No, no, no. Hello? 
Oh, I'll speak up a little bit. It's all good. So, um, yeah, I'm uh, from Mississippi originally. That's where I was born. Uh, my grandparents, mother and father from Mississippi. Uh, a lot of my family there come off um, different plantations in uh, Mississippi. So they did a lot of uh, cotton there. So the, my grandmother, she told me a story which inspired me to begin my own journey into farming and getting connected with the earth. But as we were talking when I was visiting her in Mississippi, I, I always make trips to go and visit my people because that was very important to me. So as we were talking, she mentioned how she picked 100 pounds of cotton at eight months pregnant. And it blew me away because as a grown man who thinks, you know, I work in an oil field, I work, you know, I do so much hard work, which it was very hard. But thinking about picking 100 pounds of cotton, you know, eight months pregnant, and it, it just blew me away. And so once she told me that story on my way back coming to uh, Louisiana, I stopped at the cotton field and pick up some cotton and brought it home with me. And that was always my, you know, um, my item to look back on and to reminisce and think about, you know, those stories that she told me. And my grandfather was right there as she was telling me. And he was like, yeah, on a good day, I'd pick 400 pounds. And I'm like, 400 pounds of cotton, you know? So I'm thinking, and they're older, you know, I'm spending quality time with them, but they're telling me these stories and I'm not realizing the influence that that put on my future. So when I got back, everything became a lot easier for me. My struggles even at work because working in the oil field, uh, the money was real good. I graduated in 2007, grad high school. So I had a job coming out of high school. So I'm making good money, working in the oil field, learning, you know, fresh energy. And the money was real good, you know. Um, I was doing the right thing. I, I, so I thought, you know, working, having a good job, and after a couple of years, I realized the uh, intensity of the work and plus the toxic chemicals and everything that I was exposed to wasn't worth me giving my whole life. But at that point in time, it was hard for me to just say, okay, I'm just going to leave and go do what I want to do because how are you going to make a future for yourself? How are you going to make, you know, income? How are you going to do for yourself? So it took me years of development, learning my skill, learning my trade, keeping a job, um, you know, just staying out of trouble, just being a responsible young man, that right there led me to pretty much the knowledge of myself through that job, because getting frustrated with the job and trying to think of a plan out and, you know, just talking to elderly people and different people, um, it really struck something in me to make myself more determined to follow my life's path instead of following the job and the money. So that right there took me to um, another place in life. I caught the flu 2013 and that was my first time ever really getting sick. You know, I'd always had a high, good immune system going, growing up in school. I was 12 years, perfect attendance, never missed a day of school. So I wasn't used to getting sick. And when that hit me, you know, my grandfather, we were talking on the phone. He was in Georgia. He was like, uh, you're not eating right. And uh, when he said that, it, it kind of stunned me. And I'm like, I'm not eating right. And I thought, what did I eat yesterday? McDonald's. What did I eat the day before that? Popeye's. What did I eat? And I'm like, you know, how would he know that? And we don't stay together, you know? And after that, you know, it really took me through a journey because that's when I became more conscious of my own self. You know, the importance of eating healthy, the importance of learning where your food comes from, um, how to grow it, how to cultivate it. And so it's like my DNA memory just started to impact my life heavily at that point in time and by that time I was um just about ready to become a full-time entrepreneur I'd line my assets up and did everything I needed to do and and now I'm eating healthy and going that direction and uh I made that that change that jump in uh November of 2013 November 7th uh so it'll be uh 10 years this year I've been a full-time entrepreneur and at that point in time, I was still getting more familiar with foods and eating fresh, healthy foods. And I started going places like um, Whole Foods, going places like the Fresh Market in Lafayette. And I'm, you know, just observing like how they have a whole different type of food set up, different food options, you know, food with different stickers and labels. So I'm studying. I'm like, what's going on? You know, and I go back to, you know, my neighborhood and it's food deserts and it's, you know, chips and cookies and beer and cigarettes. And, you know, I'm like, wow, what, what's really going on? So now that I had the time on my own hands, since I was a full-time entrepreneur, I had made it um, my own duty to follow that passion and that calling in that direction. And at that time, when I left the job, it was a very dear friend of mine. His name was Mr. Rudolph Plumboy. And he had a, a club. Uh, he called it his saloon uh, on Hopkins Street. 
and uh, he was from New Iberia, born in um late 30s. So he came up in New Iberia. He was one of the first lifeguards, actually, in the West End Park. Um, and so, you know, New Iberia was his hometown. He had traveled. He had um, joined the service. He had did some time there, came back. He had, you know, landed in uh, Kansas City. So he stayed there for quite a while. And um, I'm mentioning this guy because he he was a great influence who made some connections in this town and who had done a lot of work in this town, who's no longer here with us. But at the same time, his spirit is here. And he always told me, you know, as long as you talk about me, we'll always, uh, I'll always be living. So he's like, and that stuck with me, you know, and when he passed and I'm like, you know, when I talk about him at time, I'm like, yeah, you know, cause he did say we'll be friends for a lifetime, you know, and beyond. So it all made sense full circle. And, um, him and I had partnered up because I'm fresh out of the oil field and I was able to come and see what he had going on. Cause I was always uh, aware that he had a project going on in New Iberia, but I never knew exactly where and what he was doing. So when I came to New Iberia to, um, to see what was happening and how we first met, he was dating a lady in Abbeville and I was staying in Abbeville at the time. So I'm a transplant from Abbeville to New Iberia. And, um, <laughs> and Mr. Rudy was um, a very stern man, you know, and he's very, very funny in his way too. He's very real. So he'd be, at the apartment sometime when I was still working in the oil field, you know, he'd give me tips and advice. Hey, tell your company to pick up the trash. You know, they, you know, if I'm making too much noise upstairs, he'll bang on the, the, the wall. So we had a pretty good relationship. And he would always tell me about, you know, his uh, club business that he was starting in New Iberia. And um, he'd speak highly of it. And I seen over the years how he would continue telling me about the progress he's making. So when I finally left the oil field, by that time, he had moved his lady here to New Iberia with him, and she was here for a couple of years by then. And um, I pulled in on him one day out the blue. My spirit just said, come to New Iberia. And I came through driving. And I'd always liked the vibe of New Iberia, you know, the energy. I just always drawn to New Iberia for some type of reason. A lot of people, I don't like New Iberia, but I do like the soul, the community. It needs um, change it needs you know to evolve in ways it needs you know a lot of progress to be made but at the same time we are here to make it and um so I'm driving through and I see him outside his club legs crossed you know sipping on some wine I said let me turn in let me see what Mr. Rudy got going on today and um I turned in on him he was happy to see me I was happy to see him and it had been a while since we had actually seen each other and uh geez. He was like, come on, man, let me show you the progress. Let me show you what's going on, what I've been telling you about. So he opened the doors to his club and showed me how he, you know, it redid the bar. It was nice and long and wood grain on top. And he had, he had nice glasses in there. He was big on class. He was like, I don't like no styrofoam, no plastic cups. Everything's glass, you know. So he was showing me just all of his improvements. And I was blown away, like, seeing that this is an elderly man, elderly black man who's doing this and uh, putting his heart in this when he's old and kind of sickly himself. So I knew right then and there, it was something special about him and it was something special about what he was doing. And at that time I was, you know, fresh out of the oil field and um, we, you know, had a conversation and uh, you know, he had needed some funds or whatnot to get some license and do what he needed to do. And at that point in time, you know, I, it was right there available. And I gave it to him. And um, from there, he said, we'll be friends for a lifetime. And I didn't really quite understand that then. I was like, okay, yeah. And then he ended up giving the funds back and everything. And um, we were friends for a lifetime. He made me his manager at his club. Um, he, he would teach me things about the community, about the people. Um, the elders who would come in would talk to me. They took a liking to me. Um, he was always just real with me, real and frank. So it was beyond money. It was beyond you know, the material, it was really a, a soulful connection that we had. And um, one day he introduced me and Panat here, who's sitting in the audience. And uh, we were at an event and he introduced us together. And after that, many, several days after that, he mentioned, hey, um, you know, I'm in a fourth quarter and I'm in a um, red zone. So he was pretty much telling me he's about to, you know, kick the can soon. And uh, he'd always tell me, you know, I'm in the fourth quarter, but now he was like, I'm in a red zone. And he was like, uh, I want you to do something. I'm like, all right. He said, go down to the garden uh, down the street there. And he described where it was across the street from Mixon. And, uh, you know, go there and check it out. You know, tell him I sent you. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll do that. So I did. 
And um, I didn't go right away to tell him I went to check it out. And so on the day that I was going, I took my clothes out, ironed them, creased them. Back then, I had a low haircut, you know, low ball fade. So, you know, I was a different. I looked totally different, but um, sharp. So I laid my clothes out, and it was about 12 o'clock that evening. I got a call, you know, and um, they told me he had passed away, you know. So I'm like, oh, man, you know, I was just going to tell him that night that I went over there and checked it out, and thank you for telling me about it because I never even realized it was their community garden, you know, and that was big because I was um, at that point in time learning about plants and I had planted a couple of plants at my house. I had a cactus and I had a hibiscus plant <laughs> and, you know, I was just experimenting um, a small little sidewalk garden. It wasn't even big. Uh, it may have been this wide to the walls. And that was it. You know, I had a tomato bush in there. I had, um, cucumbers you know just a few plants just getting started and when I went and checked out the community garden you know he had hydroponics growing he had you know set up and I'm like wow you go in there and you're like you're in a whole nother world I'm like this is what it is you know and I, I just continued going because um the energy was good the intentions I seen were righteous uh you know it was just a good place in the community and good start so I said okay Mr. Rudy didn't lead me here for nothing and I really didn't understand or understand at first because I'm like okay I've been an entrepreneur at that point in time for about three years you know times were hard already and like you know you go and you you work and then you get food for your compensation you know so I'm like you know it's still not putting that on the table so my spirit say stick with it it don't matter you know so you got to go through your own hardships because you didn't come this far to say oh, I'm almost there but you just got to do what you have to do and that's what I did and um me and Panat, we started exchanging ideas. You know, he seen that I was very consistent coming there and, um, you know, work. And I learned pretty fast. So we started working together and putting our minds together. And next thing you know, it was uh, July the 7th. Um, no, it was July the 11th, actually, because it was 7-11. Um, the opportunity came about where, you know, it was an um, opportunity with the market space on 520 South Hopkins Street, that um, that space there, which was an abandoned building at the time, it became available for use for us. Um, and I joined his organization, which was called uh, Envision the Berry. So as I'm working with him in the garden and working along, you know, in, with Envision the Berry, that opportunity came about six months after him and I first initially met and I started working, you know, and everything else like that. Um, and this experience, you know, is real unique because, you know, it's, it's now produced a whole lot here in New Iberia where a whole community is uh, now formed, you know, people come there and have been coming there for years, you know, if they want to know where their family member at, they know where their family member is there and they're safe. They can come for okra, they can come for canned goods, they can come for soaps, incense. You know, I I had a business prior to um the market. Like when I left the oil field, I had a hair business, but I also had like African products. I had African handbags, I had soaps and things like that. And I always wanted a storefront. So it was like it all manifested. And so when I was asked to, you know, pioneer that project there, that grassroots project and be the face of it, you know, I knew I was in alignment with it because of my experiences you know a little prior to that a couple of years prior to that I was studying about black people African people I was studying about how we are from Africa how we are uh, our experience with slavery is uh not really talked about not told in the right light and how we weren't slaves forever you know and uh the history with slavery we have to realize with food and history, we have a history with foods just like we have a history with our own family and our DNA. So we've been eating a certain food for so long through our cultural experiences. So when we were enslaved, I'll jump in that in just a minute because I'll go back to you know Mr. Rudy and Envision the Berry, then I'll go there because that was my next step. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But these are some pictures also just for the from the experience. I'm a beautiful child right there. She's six months old, my first daughter. Um, so to go back to the connection with Panat and I, you know, how that helped, um, create a partnership and create trust because I didn't know him and he didn't know me, you know, we knew each other on the strength of Mr. Rudy, but I didn't know the depths of what Envision the Barry was all about, you know, and he didn't know, you know, my background fully. 
but that open door and that trust and that partnership right there help open up opportunities for myself and opportunities for many others, you know, and also opportunities for him to see, you know, that his hard work and um, his years of experience and coming back to a community to make things happen, you know, all paid off and is paying off in a lot of ways. And uh, along with my experience and expertise and hard work in the oil field and everything, and my goals to become an entrepreneur and to give back to my people, because that's what I wanted to do. Once I learned about who I was and through changing my diet and how much that made a difference in my life, I was like, I have to give this back to my people some way, somehow. And experiencing those experiences at Whole Foods and other places and realizing that our people don't have access to these places. You know, they can't just get up in the car and let's go to Lafayette, you know, let's bring the family and they can't afford a lot of the foods there. So what can we do about this? So making a place where we can, you know, grow food and have people in the garden and come get that experience. And it's changed the game, you know, um, older people, younger people, um, people come sometimes just to get out, just to say they can come to a place and feel like they're out of town, but right in town. And, um, you know, so to go back to the market, it took many months to get the market up to par. We had to do a lot of renovation, had to put the big door up in the front and big door up in the back and take the ceiling down and tear down things. And, you know, it wasn't like we were on a uh, salary. We just had to do what we had to do and make it happen until we could get everything in place to actually open up. So um, the summer of 2016 up until um, the beginning of 2017, so we actually had a grand opening in, in January 2017. And, um, and that was pretty amazing. You know, a lot of people were looking and a lot of people did come and attend. The community at first was very standoff, very standoffish because they weren't familiar with this type of business in town. And what is it? Who's behind it? What's going on? You know, they had to really get a feel of it and, and really understand like we're bringing something healthy, holistic, uh, safe to the community. But once they, you know, came in and seen what was going on after a couple of years, it really took a couple of years before they really came on in and, and seen what was going on. But after a couple of years of hearing, you know, the tiller in the back or seeing, you know, me working and talking to different people and helping different people, the trust opened up and being a transplant in New Iberia. So they don't know your family or where you come from, too. So that and I can understand that. And uh Times even had got hard for me. So once we opened up the market and I, you know, just took up on the, the leadership role to be the one who opened the market day to day and to say, I'm gonna put myself in position to have ownership of this market here, because that was the, you know, part of the negotiation. And um, I gave my everything to it, even living in there for like three whole years, you know, sleeping on the concrete floors, you know, having an air mattress, you know, um, you know, you're around a lot of chaos because, you know, the community was going through a whole lot at that time. So young men around my age getting killed, you know, people you just talked to days ago, you know, giving them advice, trying to help them stay on track, you know, lost their life in the struggle. So it's like a lot going on, even for me having to protect myself and having to set those boundaries, you know, like this is what it is here, you know, because if you're not a strong individual coming in the community like that, you know, it, it'd be very dangerous. You not guaranteed to survive or to just stay there. So you have to, you know, set the boundaries or, you know, knowing to put the law down from the get go. This is what it is. This is what it's about. And this is how it's going to go. And, and people respect that. And next thing you know, I had people in the community coming. You need a little help. Can I do a little work? Um, what you need done, you know, beating me to the market sometimes. I'm on waiting on me. So that was a, a very great start because I said, wow, look at this, you know, went from an abandoned building to a, now a business, now um, a place where you can see old people, young people, people of African descent, people of, of, you know, Chinese come through sometimes. You have, you know, Europeans, you have a mix up of a lot of different people. Some people come speaking French. I had one um, moment where they were speaking three different languages at one time in the market. You had some French people, you had some um, Hispanic people, you know, and you had some people talking English. And I was like, wow, just look at this, you know? <laughs> um, and to get into the food part, the food aspect, the farming aspect of it, 
um, being the history we have, I have a few notes here. It was a book that I read called uh, Shifting Your Paradigm for Optimum Health and Longevity. And I read that book there and it actually helped inspire me and align myself with not only knowing the knowledge of where our foods come from, but with me changing my own diet and having a, a real experience with myself, um, which took me deeper into my own roots to where I could really understand, you know, who I am through history and through diet. And um, I just want to read a few notes from the book that I took. And it says, it is, it is historically documented that Europeans credited slaves with the introduction of specific foods to the Americas, all previously grown in Africa. Um, you had uh, okra, chili peppers, watermelon, cabbage, white potatoes, squash, black eyed peas, just to name a few. Uh, some of the dishes are gumbo, yams, jambalaya, watermelon, okra, uh, rice pudding, Ethiopian coffee are all foods also from Africa. Um, and those Africans there, you know, did a lot of jobs, you know, a lot of household jobs, but also a lot of garden jobs, a lot of uh, agriculture, because you needed food to eat, and then you needed food to sell, import and export. Um, and they had cash crops such as tobacco, rice, indigo, cotton, corn, wheat, sugar, et cetera. And at that point in time, too, our people had kitchen gardens, so they didn't have to go to the store and buy bell peppers and onions and tomatoes and cucumbers. They had a lot of things already right there growing in the yard, and you didn't even need a big yard to grow a lot of that. I remember going, pulling up at my grandmother's house one day and seeing bell peppers growing all around the house. I'm like, wow, look at this. It was beautiful, you know, a beautiful sight. And that was my first time seeing that before, you know? So when I grow peppers now, I try to, I think of that model, but I still have to step it up because I'm like, they had it going on. And, um, but that helped because a lot of our grandparents and a lot of you all, maybe, you know, parents even had that already. So it was common to have, um, gardens it wasn't foreign um over time we've lost a lot of land as as a people we've really stepped backwards in a lot of ways we've gotten away from farming and a lot of it has to do with two these days um stepping away from anything that makes you feel like you know you're still attached to slavery and which that's a very misconception because at the same time we've always had land you know prior to even slavery not only just an acre or two, but thousands and thousands of acres, you know, enough land where you didn't have to fight over. And we knew how to cultivate. We knew how to grow foods. We were masters at it. We were, we were healers. We knew how to heal ourselves. We didn't have um, hospitals where you just go and, you know, get medication. We had, you know, herbs. We had teas. We had paste. We we, we knew what we were doing. You know, we, we had the, the science down to the T. So these days, a lot of younger people you know, what is that? You know, farming ain't going to give me no money. Like, how am I going to get money out? And in a way, they are right, because if you don't have the land, if you're farming for somebody else and, you know, you're slaving in that way, making pennies on dollars, then you kind of have, you know, you make sense. But at the same time, we have to realize that we have to get land. We have to become landowners. Um, we have to work our way there. And we have to know the skill. We don't need to be reliant relying on other people to do what we should do for ourselves anyways you know self-preservation comes from the inward so we have to know we need to know how to build we need to know all the life necessities and we have the ability to do that but we also have to erect you know different places in the communities where we can start doing that where we can come together and take these talents and take the this knowledge and take you know the experiences that we experience through growing and developing and, and make it happen in order to make that way and that's a big part of what you know the berry fresh market and uh, what's going on there uptown because like i say a lot of people hear a lot of the bad things that happen but they don't know a lot of the great things a lot of the futuristic ideas and things that's happening there is really going to help change you know not only this area but you know it's going to become nationwide sooner or later because I'm realizing that the younger generation who are wanting to know about plants and wanting to know about, um, you know, business, just how they can make business and be creative and make whatever they make, because the, uh, the market is also a place where 
people can um, use it as a co-op. What, what they grow, they can bring to the market and sell. Um, what they make, such as jewelry, such as different soaps or hair products or, or teas, they can bring it there and also sell it. Um, there's just a variety of different produce. Uh, some produce is homegrown. Some produce, such as like a lot of the oranges and apples there, uh, I'll get from Fresh Pickens. It's another market in Lafayette. So I travel there every week to get things that aren't grown here locally, um, such as like garlic, you know, sometimes um, ginger, turmeric, different things like that, just to have a wider variety, you know, because it's good to have a wider variety and, and, and more options. But I do make that voyage every single week to go and, you know, get produce there too. And this is in the back of the garden right here. So this is where we tilling the ground, you know, getting it right. We use uh, nothing but compost, uh, whether it's coffee grinds, banana peelings, orange peelings, you know, um, breaking down cardboard boxes. I've ordered worms to put in a worm bed, you know, to feed the worms and just adding that soil right there back to the earth and, and not using uh, different chemicals that may be harmful for the body. Although they can make your plants jump and grow and look beautiful, but at the same time, you know, we're eating for nutrients, you know, we're not trying to poison ourselves because food could be, you know, um, the best medicine or the slowest form of poison. So just making smart decisions and smart choices and um, when it comes down to dieting and having the children, you know, they're in hands on because that's a experience that a lot of children are not getting these days because they're hooked to uh, video games they're hooked to, you know, the Internet. So going outside and playing is not the same going outside playing when we were young. It was a real adventure. We didn't have the cell phones and things. You had a, hey, you had to find me, you know. <laughs> so, you know, getting them back, and it's not their fault. So creating places and spaces such as this and many others, because it's a lot more that needs to be created and developed in New Iberia. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot of talent out there. It's a lot of ambitious people. And it's a lot of people that need, you know, some type of leadership or, or, or motivation. Um, and encouragement because, uh, you know, we can do it, we'll do it. And uh, I really do appreciate the partnerships that we've created also um, here at the Shadows, also with the Historical Society. Miss um, Phoebe, I'm very proud and honored of you and what you do. And I appreciate you since we've met, you know, um, you've been so unique to me. And it was an uh, inspiration to see someone older who, are, who was fighting in that area, in that field, and, and even had more experience than me who's pioneered this. So that's, you know, gives me more strength and fight and determination myself too. So if you didn't know that, that's exactly how I feel and, and been feeling. So, you know, and I'm glad to be a, a, a part of the process of, you know, being able to connect people and um, being able to be an asset in my community and be able to be available and, and take the time out to build and, and partner and, and see y'all beautiful faces and energy and things of that nature. Um, I will share a few more facts here that I had uh, following emancipation in the civil rights era, uh, sharecropping in the reconstruction era was very difficult for nearly 4 million African Americans when whites neglected to accept their freedom and equality. Uh, many of the traditions that were shaped by the African diets in America originated in West Africa, despite the 250 years of enslavement. Um, uh, let's see, during the civil rights era, uh, you had the, even the Nation of Islam at that point in time, they uh, had a slogan, which was eat to live. And um, I'm not a Muslim, but I did respect that that fact that they were speaking towards consciousness in, in, in a way of foods, you know, in a way of, of dieting and showing that that made a difference because, you know, you could tell it reflected on them in a different type of way. And you could see that that type of um, that type of self-discipline you know will, will will pay off tremendously and and we are what we eat <laughs> literally we are so you know it will pay for us to be more conscious about you know what we eat and uh not be so hard on ourselves or beat ourselves up either but just taking the daily steps of writing different goals down and to reach our our health goals you know to um support you know different people who are trying who are they're making themselves available because you really do have to commit your whole lifestyle towards it, you know, because it's not a game. It's not child's play. Um, you have to be grounded, you know, and um, making positive, powerful things happen. 
and especially being of African descent, it's it's a different experience, totally different experience. Um, a lot of young people are alienated from their own identity, you know, and that happens at a very young age. So it's like we have a crisis really going on that we need to put a, a light on, you know, in order to reverse the statistics, you know, to change the the different patterns of behavior. And a lot of that does start with foods. And I had one other um, paper here. Maybe I left it, but uh, that's okay too. But I had some more information speaking on having the children conscious of what they eat because we have those children drinking a lot of sugar, a lot of just sweets, a lot of meats, a lot of fast foods and not realizing that that's, you know, triggering their minds and brains and attitudes and behaviors and things. And we're thinking that they have ADHD or they written that they need medications that'll dope them up early. And all actuality, they need to be outside planting the dirt, planting, looking, seeing the process of what it is to live and survive and, and to, you know, just take over their own lifestyles and not let, you know, certain other lifestyles take over them. But just that that exposure is uh, good for the children. And um, I applaud what we're all doing, you know, and, and taking our um, responsibility in our communities and our families and stepping up and being, you know, part of um, the progress and going into the future, you know, having different ideas and not being afraid to, um, display who you are, you know, and display your your courage and your love and your passion for, you know, yourself, your people, or in humanity as a whole. Nature, um, it all goes back to nature at the end of the day, and that's what I really, you know, just align my life with nature, natural principles, and forces. And um, through African spirituality, that's what helped me also get in tune with my inner forces and my spirit man to have me grounded enough to say I'm a young man who's going to stay focused and steadfast on this call and, and and do what needs to be done and and be that example for younger and older people because um, I've had a lot of elderly people who came and gone even with this experience who had not only faith in me but faith in themselves too because I've seen different changes in them before they made their transition you know finding a certain type of peace or happiness or eating healthier food like and, the, and maybe even have expanded their lifespan opportunity to be here i'm glad to come speak on these different topics favorite histories you know because when we go back and realize that we've been masters you know we've been we've been alienated from for ourselves over a period of time but we're stepping back into our generational memory is, is starting to you know come back to us and open our eyes and and show us what we need to do and and to make and last but not least i'm grateful to see some farmers in a building you know i see one great farmer right in front of me i shake his hand again <laughs> He's uh he inspired me also because he grows okra uh, and he grows okra on a big scale, you know, fields of okra and everybody knows him in the community, Mr. Willie. We have different um workers who work with both of us, you know, so it's 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 a good experience to see that. And um I also want to learn a lot more on how to cultivate okra on that level, you know, with your expertise, you know. Me and Tammy talked earlier. She said she wanted to be here, but she was out of town. But um, I've been there with them, you know, to see their garden before. Um, his daughter, Tammy, and I, me and her have worked together. She's contributed. Um, you know, I'm glad about these connections. Miss Charlene, she's in the building. Um, I've been to her garden, too, and she grows okra on a, on a great level, too, on a grand scale. So it was really a blessing to see her doing what she do and, um, you know, standing ten toes about her land and cultivating and to do to get access to you know um different opportunities and resources to help take her further just like us all especially black farmers we we're not in the loop of having the the the, the opportunities the same opportunities they're not equal at all which truth be told we never got the 40 acres and a mule you know so 
it's like you know come on now so but we'll make it happen you know and um thank you for everybody who showed up thank you a lot all right